And we have three speakers, Florian Glatz, trained as a lawyer and software developer with many years of experience working full-time in the blockchain space. Florian is aware of the key issues in the intersection of crypto assets and regulations. Florian Glatz has co-founded and led the German Blockchain Associations, has president for its first four years. He advised political decision makers at the German and European level of blockchain regulation. Marina Markesic. <laughs> Marina is the co-founder of EUIC, which aims to propel UA regulation to become DeFi friendly. Since 2017, Marina has been advising crypto projects on governance and legal matters with focus on decentralization. Sorry, please. If you want any question to the speakers, uh, you can talk outside of the room. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Define. Uh, mm -mm. She previously led the advisory team of Blockchain Accelerator, co-founded co -found it, and co-found a crowd investment platform. And Simon Paul Roth, educating on crypto and public blockchain since 2050. Um, well, welcome, um, please give it up to the speakers. So thank you everyone for joining our talk. Uh, my name is Marina and together with Simon and Florian, we're going to talk about the crypto regulation and its uh, influence on the open blockchains. So what we see today, it's an increased activity of crypto regulation all around yeah. the world. Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll just wait for two minutes because <laughs> the counter then starts. So what I will talk today is basically on the um, increased regulatory activities from all over the world. We are coming from Europe and we're trying to talk about the trends that happen all around the world but basically what we're expert is in the European law. And why this is interesting is because last week we had some new laws being finalized in Europe and they are, I would say, the beginning of what's happening globally. So, um, as... Sir, of course. So, um, Florian Simon and I started the European Crypto Initiative, which is a non-profit based in Brussels, exactly two years ago when the first uh, crypto assets uh, draft for marketing crypto assets regulation has been issued. So basically this has been leaked and we have seen it online and we said we should do something about it. So immediately in the next week, we basically started talking to the regulators about this topic. Um, are we st okay. Sorry, there's no presentation, but I'm going to go uh, on without it. So basically what we are doing is talking to the regulators and trying to explain what is happening in the crypto area and trying to educate them on what we're doing and what blockchain is. So what happens in generally in the last two years specifically is that there has been an increased regulatory activity from regulators all over the world. And what is very important is that this activity is coordinated. So it is happening in Europe, it's happening in the US, but what is also very, very important is that it's happening on the international level, on international org organizations. So basically organizations like FAREV, IOSCO, and some other organizations are very actively looking into crypto and also very actively looking into DeFi specifically. In the next, I would say one and two or two years, we will see reports from all of those organizations being published and this will be a big influence not only in the world where we're coming from, so the European Union, but basically it is going to be a big influence also in Colombia, in South America, Asia and all over the world. What it is important is that many times those regulators 
they are very well intended and we are talking to a lot of them. They are interested to learn more, but the problem is that they don't have that much time. So of course we have like an hour, one hour talk with them and we need to be very precise on what we are discussing in this uh, really short amount of time. And the problem is that many times because they don't have this, I would say knowledge or at least opportunity to learn more, the outcome of this regulation is even more negative than they wanted to at the beginning. And so I think that educating regulators, uh, talking to them, and even educating about crypto in general is very, very important. So besides what's happening, uh, I would say, on the international level, we have seen also a lot of bad news happening in the last year, and this is not helping. The regulators are seeing and mostly reading news that are negative, and this is then reflected in regulation. We have seen in the Markets in Crypto Assets draft added a new article specifically talking and specifically being, um, I would say, uh, a consequence of what happened with Terra Luna. And we also can see this in uh, the stablecoin um, bill that is uh, written in the SEC. So, in a way, it's also important of what is the image that the whole crypto community projects in the world, but also in the, uh, specifically for the regulators. So, why this time right now is so important for all of us to talk about regulation? is basically because we know that crypto exists for more than a decade, but at the beginning it was really seen more as a toy for geeks, I would say, and it was not seen as something that would be uh, problematic for the financial system, which is right now. So in from 2020 or for the last, I would say, couple of years, there is an increased concern from the regulator of what crypto is possible. We have seen um, a lot of scams, we have seen DeFi being developed, but also the increased usage of NFTs. And this is what is also concerning for the regulators, especially when it comes to consumer protection. And so what we need to do in the future is think about really new options and new alternatives and how to have an even more increased dialogue with the regulators because the, all the development that happened in the last years will most probably not be just copy-pasted in the future because of specific limitations that we will, we will see uh, coming from the regulatory world. So I'll just come up to date. So this is what I was talking about an increased activity from the regulators in the last few years. As I said, last week we have seen markets and crypto assets regulation and the transfer of funds regulation being finalized in Europe. And what does this mean for this community? What does this mean for the people that are building applications and they are building protocols for the people that are also using these applications and protocols? And I will only give you a few examples that are I would say quite important, and again, those are European examples, but it's in a way only the start, because the markets in crypto assets regulation is the first worldwide overarching regulation for crypto. So if you are a crypto asset service provider, for example, as an exchange or a wallet, you will need to be incorporated in Europe and you will need to get a license from a European national competent authority. What is important is that you're also going to be, need to be compliant with anti-money laundering rules. Uh, if you are not, you will not be able to issue or to offer services to the European Union, which means that um, the European user is only going to have the opportunity to use services that are regulated and compliant under markets and crypto assets regulation. Also an interesting part is the crypto asset issuance. So if an entity wants to issue crypto assets in Europe and offer it to the, crypto asset, uh, to the European users, it will need to be incorporated again in the European Union, but at the same time also write a white paper, very similarly to like a very short, um, very similar to an IPO, 
And in this white paper, there are a lot of rules around marketing, but also there needs to be a report on the energy consumption of this specific crypto asset and the blockchain that it uses. This is going to have a very important effect on the listing of different crypto assets. So again, the crypto assets that are not going to be compliant, they will not be able to list it on exchanges that are offering their services in the European Union. And let me come to the most critical part of the markets and crypto assets regulation. So this regulation was basically written because of Diem. And so the aim is to regulate stable coins. There is a big part in the regulation that regulates stable coins. And this is, I would say, the most critical part. There is a cap of 200 million transactions per day in the European Union that needs to be observed by the issuer of the stable coin, but also by the regulator. So there are obligations like reporting obligations that the crypto issuer, stablecoin issuer, needs to send quarterly to the regulator, which means that they need to send all the information of the number of transactions, uh, the users, etc. And if those limitations are not met, the, the, basically it's not possible to operate in Europe anymore. The license that this stablecoin issuers would have, they will lose it at that moment. And there's another part, the markets and crypto assets regulation even talks about um, the stopping of issuance of stablecoins from those uh, stablecoin issuers. This is, uh, I would say, quite critical, and we're going to see how it will work in practice. But the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation is public, so you can read it online and then uh, form your own opinions. The last part from my side is the non-fungible tokens. Those are excluded from the regulation, but only the ones that are unique and usually linked to an art and also issued in a very small collections. So that's all for me. I give the mic to Florian. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marina. Oopsie. Bringer of bad news. Okay. Um, where do I click here? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so let's talk about the positive sides of this regulation because it's not just bad. I mean, that was pretty bad. I agree, but... Um, not everything is that awful. So uh, the scope of Mika, of this market in crypto regulation, is limited in a sense to centralized uh, applications of crypto technology, meaning that decentralized finance, NFTs are officially not in that scope yet. Um, so we expect, in a sense, a Mika 2 regulation to sort of follow up in, I don't know, a few years. And um, that's something we'll address later. Uh, Self-custodial wallets survived a pretty, pretty hard, harsh attack from the European Parliament. Um, we were afraid for a few weeks, like most of you probably, that they may be banned. Um, so uh, good news, uh, Europe still accepts uh, self-custodial wallets going forward. Uh, proof of work also survived, so there was a real chance that proof of work assets would be flat out illegal in Europe. That also was this year. And uh, I think they got away with a slap on the wrist. So um, proof of work assets have been labeled as unsustainable, but there are no consequences yet tied to it. But the foundation has been laid for uh, a potential ban later on or very negative tax implications for holding them, those kinds of things. Um, the result is in a, in a sense sort of a white elephant. So it's not as bad because it's sort of scoped to only regulate centralized uh, applications, not the decentralized ones. However, it's really framing everything in the terms of the status quo and in terms of financial assets. So Europe does not yet really recognize on the legislative level that crypto is more than just money. Um, and you know, what we just celebrated as wins are really just temporary exclusions for the regulators. Um, the long-term impacts that we see of the regulation in Europe that has been passed now and that is, you know, following um, is definitely um, going to be looking at, that it's going to be looking at DeFi and NFTs much more. It's already on the radar of regulators. They, they are writing reports on this in the European Commission and the Parliament. 
And um, a big, big question there is what is actually decentralization? Is this a real thing? Can we actually observe this in the real world? Can we pinpoint regulators to a system and say, look at that, this is true decentralization. This is what we mean when we say decentralization is not the same as centralized services. Uh, the energy crisis in Europe, of course, is real. Everybody knows that. And so uh, we expect, you know, more sort of restrictions around proof of work. Um, it's probably not going to be a sustainable business or investment uh, for Europeans. Um, stable coins continue to be the most controversial and sort of most regulated topic going forward. Uh, we expect the US, for example, to draft a stable coin bill in the next 12 months. Um, and Europe will definitely, uh, you know, continue to be very strict on regulating them. Funny enough, nobody talks about Facebook anymore and their stablecoin because they shelved the project. Now it's just a Terra Luna as being the scapegoat. Um, we've all seen what happened with Tornado Cash, so privacy preserving protocols will be very, very um, highly regulated going forward. So um, this is uh, definitely still something where we advise everybody to be super, super um, careful. Yeah, thoughts on the future. Um, right now, the legitimacy of the crypto space, the perceived legitimacy of the crypto space in the court of public opinion is pretty low. It's maybe at its lowest point ever. Um, the uh, incumbents that we challenge with this technology are uh, super active in spreading FUD about crypto. You can read their reports. Uh, central banks, of course, regulators on the international level like the Financial Action Task Force, commercial banks and national regulators, they are all sort of aligned on keeping this technology from reaching mass market adoption in its current decentralized form. And so, you know, there are two sort of problems we have to address as a community. One is the fact that regulation is certain, but the other one is that we do not have the support of the public right now. We're literally a small elite that's sort of growing, but not fast enough, and most people are not inside our bubble, and they sort of follow what they read in the news, and that's mostly bad. So we have to somehow come up with a way as a community to surface the goodness and sort of label the bad stuff as what it is, bad. So scams, hacks, money laundering, paid shills and influences, uninformed investments by the public in things like, you know, stable coins that are going to explode next week. Uh, we should sort of not do that. And it's, I think, a collective failure of the whole space that we haven't come up with any effective means um, to, to do this. And um, I want to give it to Simon to, to take this further. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, what do we do now? Um, the, the future looks uh, uncertain. And the per global per perception of crypto is not ideal. And maybe what we thought the crypto would, would make as an impact to the world has not yet fully materialized. Uh, so we are at a very critical moment. Uh, because, as, you, as we said, all the regulators are looking at us. And the results that we are pushing forward and are maybe not as wonderful as we want them to be. Uh, so what we think now is that we have to be a force of proposal, like as an industry, as a community, uh, we have to somehow, and we have a plan for that, um, create some form of proposal, some form of uh, initiatives that basically go front run the regulators, front run uh, the institutions, and explain what we can do, what we are doing today uh, in a very positive manner and with actual practical uh, mitigation proposals for all the risks and all the, the issues that we see today. Um, and to do that, uh, one of the critical things is to create some form of consensus inside of the community, inside of the industry of what is acceptable and what we can push forward. Uh, because we definitely don't want to give IDs to the regulators that would be contrary to the values that we want to defend, right? Uh, so there will be difficult choices to make, uh, and there's a lot of potential solutions that we can think about, uh, both technological uh, or in terms of uh, initiatives that the community can make. 
but are they acceptable? Is this something that we want to push forward? And this is an open question that uh, we will discuss later. Um, so for the, for, as an example, um, the European Commission launched an initiative to study whether it would be meaningful to uh, basically embed a surveillance of the blockchain, a real-time surveillance of public blockchain um, in, in a, some form of, of a, a system that would be uh, used by the regulators to basically be alerted and, and, and act on potential issues ac happening on the public blockchains. Do we want that? Do we, do we, do we support these kind of initiatives? Um, do we regulate interfaces? Of course, this is a very big subject and the tone of the cash sanctions really make it shine. Um, and this is still an open question. Uh, do we regulate and if so, how? Uh, do we want to circumvent that by creating shadow interfaces? Uh, is it a long-term solution? Open question again. Uh, do we want to leverage DIDs in some form, like creating identities that would be recognized by institutions in some way? Uh, do we leverage on the, the initiatives of the institutions on DIDs, because there are some in Europe specifically? Um, do we basically segment regulated and digital space? Um, it, it's a potential solution. and. Of course, the whole sanction uh, in general, is, it's, it's a very big subject and still uh, with a, a lot of uh, different implications where there's a lot of also of open questions. You've all seen uh, the discussions recently about do we uh, need to um, basically sanction address at the protocol level? It's a very uh, dangerous question to ask, but also a very practical one. And uh, the, the answer has to, be, has to be given at some point. So these are basically solutions that could be uh, moved forward. Do we want that? And basically to decide this, we need to decide what are the non-negotiable values of, of the, the community, of the, of the industry today. Uh, it could be a lot of things, like uh, credible neutrality of the, the public networks. Is that, is that the, f the most important thing that we want to protect? Is this like the composability, like the openness? So we want to basically fight every kind of you know, KYC, um, things that could limit this composability. Uh, is this the fight on self-custodial wallets that we have to, to prioritize? Is it privacy-preserving systems? And it can be all at once. It can be all those things, but we need to, to, to be sure that where we cross the line and what solutions we can uh, put forward or not. Um, and for this, I think uh, it's very critical that we have a very clear way forward. Uh, and there's a few things that can be leveraged to move uh, forward with the, with the institutions in general. Uh, the first thing is that um, everything is not bleak and there's a lot of people um, inside of those institutions that know about crypto and that are interested by uh, what's going on. They are open to suggestions and those people, we have identified a lot of them at the EU level but there are uh, some of them at every single, um, in every single institution worldwide. Those people, we need to help them and we need to feed them with suggestions. We need to feed them with actual proposals. And so this is the main uh, leverage we have. Um, then do we have all the, the, the good, obviously good use cases of crypto that we need to, to push forward and to move forward quickly. Um, that we, we've talked a lot about with DeFi, about DeSci, uh, public good fundings, uh, non-financial use cases of crypto. All those things uh, together, they bring uh, forward a very positive way of uh, doing crypto and this is something we need to uh, work on. And of course, there's the constant uh, innovation and improvement in the space that is already happening and that, that we need to leverage, so being uh, sure that there's a, the constant information, transmission of information to the regulators and to the institutions. Um, and maybe to do that, I would like to end uh, with a call for the for community intervention. So basically, it's a call to you um, in general uh, and all the participants here. Uh, you you came here, so you you're basically interested by regulation and sit and, and and what's happening in in the future. Um, you can help. I, I mean, all of you can help uh, because we need to. There's so many paths open today. Uh, there's, of course, the path of Regulation is bad uh, per se, and we want to ba ba basically crypto to go dark and, and just don't care about the regulation. This is a way forward. Uh, we want to fully embrace regulation and basically cancel decentralization, meaning you know, ad abandon all the, 
all the values that, that, that we are trying to build today. Um, we can create new standards. We can self-regulate, um, like creating entities that, that bring rules forward that, that, are, that are followed, you know, spontaneously by, by the protocols uh, when, they want to be, uh, when they want to be compliant. Uh, we can, you know, push to make CASPs. Maybe the crypto asset service provider, the gatekeepers of crypto. This is, for now, more or less the approach of the regulator, but do we want to push in this direction? Um, do we want to create a, a DID standard for DeFi uh, altogether? Uh, do we want to create a list for name and shame, scammers, hackers, I don't know. There's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, we have ideas, we have proposals, of course, at EUCI, but we would like you to contribute and to help. Uh, so please join the conversation. We have uh, a Telegram, we have a Twitter account, we have a website, and we organize a big event in Lisbon uh, uh, from uh, November 1 to November 4. Um, feel free, if you are in Europe at the time or, or, or nearby, feel free to come and, and walk with us on, this, on these solutions. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions, so... Thank you so much. Uh, it was um, very great. Um, I have one question. So you mentioned that NFT is now currently excluded from micro regulation, but um, if we take a look and we just, you know, browse what European Council says, we see that European Council is aiming to do some assessment within the next 18 months. So uh, the regulation is coming, uh, but it's, you know, we don't know in which form yet. Therefore, my question was, um, what, in your opinion, do you think, in what shape or form the regulation on NFT would be coming? And perhaps if you could just share some insights, what would be the best way, in your opinion, to shape that regulation on NFTs? Thank you. Thank you. So for concretely on the NFTs, at the moment there is a loose definition of what an NFT is in markets in crypto assets regulation. And then every time there is going to be a new issuance, the national competent authority will need to look into and do an analysis if this is really, again, unique enough and if it's uh, issued in a small collection so it will not be regulated and it is excluded from, from Mika. What is coming next? And we were just talking to uh, one of the MPs from the European Parliament that is going to lead this effort into regulating NFTs. Uh, and we're also writing uh, some uh, positions on this topic, but it is it has started already, and there are a lot of thoughts and activities, especially in the parliament at the beginning, to just um, start with a general proposal and opinion on this, and then I think in the next few years we'll see more activities. As uh, everywhere, the European Union works in cycles, in mandates, the European Commission that usually propose the regulation will uh, finalize their own mandate very soon in a year so we'll we'll wait for the new commission to have uh, more ideas how to move forward do you think that the european union is going to be at any time a DAO? and i'm here florian <laughs> uh that's a beautiful question um i i do think that the idea of a DAO is uniquely aligned with european values so i uh, for example um, I think Europe is the continent of cooperatives. Um, I don't know if there is a continent with more. And I think cooperatives, but also associations, are sort of the old world equivalents of what DAOs are shaping up to become, sort of inclusive, cooperative ways to work together. Um, yeah, so is the European Union itself uh, fit to become a DAO? I don't think yet. They are clinging to their hierarchical design, systems design. But I think citizens of Europe are ready for DAOs, and so I do hope that they are going to front run uh, the regulator on this one, and then potentially, you know, just I don't know, swallow the EU. And uh, it <laughs> I have no idea, but yeah, I would I would support uh, the EU becoming a DAO for sure. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. There's another question over there. Oh, many questions. Uh, maybe a microphone to these gentlemen over there. Go on. Ah, here, sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Charlie. Um, from a regulatory perspective, um, if a cryptocurrency exchange 
goes bankrupt, what's the best approach? You mean a centralized or a decentralized exchange? Both. Okay, I don't know for a decentralized one. Uh, for a centralized one, there are now regulations in Mika that, um, you know, the um, the money custodied by users needs to be protected from insolvency, right? So this is really important. Um, so that so I think Mika as a regulation protects consumer interest quite well, vis-a-vis uh, -vis centralized business models and crypto as a service provider. So in this case, Mika really does help, right? Um, the problem really is where Mika touches upon more decentralized applications and where the rules don't fit the use case anymore. So um, yeah, I think solvency of a centralized exchange in Europe is regulated now with the Mika regulation. Uh, I'm not an expert on insolvency law, so uh, this is where I will stop giving advice. I don't know if Simon has anything more to say on that. Uh, no, but I see that the time is uh, is out. So oh, okay. I think for the next questions, feel free to uh, reach out to us, and and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.